Hi. In this video, I'd like to explore a topic of perennial fascination for the human race. The topic of love, which was suggested by a viewer who goes by the name of Felix McGregor. So many thanks to you, Felix McGregor, for that great idea. Anyhow, as usual, here's a roadmap of the material in this video. And for your perusal and general edification, you can also find this same roadmap in the description of this video, along with links to the timestamps. Anyhow, like I said, this video is about love. Not only what love is, but perhaps more importantly, what it can be. But the thing about love is that it's a pretty tricky topic for several reasons. The first has to do with what the word love even means. After all, we use that word in many different ways to denote many different things. On one hand, we say things like, oh, I just love your nail polish, or I love those drapes. But on the other hand, we use the exact same word to denote some of the most intense, transformative, and powerful experiences we can have in this life. But not only that, when you think about it, the meaning of love changes quite a bit throughout our lives. When we're children, it mostly denotes a sense of positive connection that hopefully happens within our families. A little later in life, it has a lot to do with lust and sexuality. Still later, it has more to do with a kind of soul connection that grows out of sharing many experiences and adventures together. So, in essence, not only does the word love denote a pretty wide range of things, but it's also a moving target whose significance is constantly changing as we ourselves mature and grow over time. So, in light of those sorts of difficulties, the first obvious question would be, <laughs> where do we even begin our exploration? Well, in this video, I'd like to begin with a rough and approximate outline of what I think are the three primary domains of love. First, the love we sometimes have for inanimate entities like nail polish, drapes, and works of art. Then, love we have for other people, and more generally for other sentient beings, which would include love for animals or any other living thing. And finally, love for life itself, for the crazy, grand, cosmological adventure into which we've all been thrown. So let's begin by looking at the love we sometimes have for inanimate entities, which would include material objects we encounter in the world, but also less tangible things like music, poetry, or dance. So, what's going on when we say that we love a material object, or a song, or a poem? Well, I sense that part of what's going on is that that kind of love involves perceiving and appreciating something as beautiful. In other words, at least in part, love of that kind is an aesthetic experience. But of course, that just defers the question, because then the next obvious one would be, well, why would that be so important to us? So much so that we use one of the most powerful and evocative words in the English language to describe it, namely, the language of love. At one point in his book, Beyond Good and Evil, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche rather famously proclaims, it is only as an aesthetic event that existence and the world are eternally justified. Okay, but why would he say that? Well, when you think about it, life contains a hell of a lot of ugliness, stupidity, and tedious mundaneity, now doesn't it? And it can easily seem like that's ultimately all there is to this world. So then the question naturally becomes, what kind of experience could possibly be powerful enough to counterbalance all of that and redeem our suffering in this life? Nietzsche's answer is that only aesthetic experience is that deep and that potent. But how so? Well, at this point, it seems to me that the answer has to do with the sense of transport, and I would even say spiritual transport that often accompanies our profound experiences of love and beauty. In other words, those kinds of aesthetic experiences are important because they sometimes carry us beyond all of the obvious absurdity and grinding unreasonableness of human existence, and show us that despite all of the many reasons we have to despise the world, it's always possible to discover a kind of redemptive value in it. Something suddenly shining like a miraculous beacon in what might otherwise be the unremitting darkness of our lives.
However, the aesthetic dimension of our love for inanimate entities is also important because of the uncanny way it sometimes draws us beyond ourselves. For instance, Rainer Maria Rilke's famous poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo, illustrates that pretty well. Here's the most popular English translation of it. The original, of course, is in German. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit. And yet, his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur, would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here, there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. In other words, our love, even for inanimate entities, is sometimes powerful enough to draw us far beyond the pale of our small and petty concerns and into the irresistible tide of time and space that surrounds us, far into the fathomless, trackless ocean of existence itself. And in those rare, radiant moments, we can perhaps begin to swim. To swim like like dolphins dancing in the vast, teeming sea of transcendence and life. Anyhow, to speak perhaps in a more personal way, I've found through the years that falling in love, even with inanimate entities, opens me a little bit more each time to the possibility of having similar experiences in the future. Basically, I've found that there's a kind of cumulative snowball effect over time where experiencing love subtly invites us to experience even more love, and ultimately draws us toward becoming something like something like pilgrim souls in passage through the night of this world. Anyhow, to give you a more concrete idea about how that's happening in my world these days, I'm going to put a link to a music video in the description section of this video. Of course, if you watch it, you might just end up being bewildered and perplexed by it. After all, it's not necessarily an easy thing to understand the lifeblood of another human being. But I'll give you that link anyway, perhaps for those of you whose souls might be kindred to my own. Or, or maybe just think of it as a strange gift. <laughs> you know, the kind that might end up taking something from you. Anyhow, at this point, let's move toward exploring love in its more interpersonal forms. And here again, there's definitely an aesthetic dimension to that. Maybe that's more obvious when we think of the dynamics of sexual love. First, because that kind of love so often circulates around physical attraction, which in turn involves the aesthetics of our physical bodies. You know, what they look like, how they move with grace and agility, etc. But beyond the aesthetics of our physical bodies, I'd say that what most of us are really looking for in the realm of sexuality is an experience that's profoundly beautiful in its own right and for its own reasons. Basically, it's a little bit like the difference between having a good screw and making love. And by the way, I'm definitely not putting down having a good screw. After all, sometimes we all like to indulge in just plain and simple animality every now and then. But, by the same token, there comes a time to make love, too, and to experience the deeper and more subtle latencies of our sexual souls. But, as fascinating and satisfying as it can be, at the end of the day, sex is only one aspect of love between human beings. And the fact is that at some point, love also involves all the other dimensions of our existence. Our intelligence emotional and otherwise, our creativity, our spirituality, our values, our sense of who we are and what our lives are about. Basically, our entire way of being. Of course, during the initial phases of attraction, almost all of us are understandably very interested in presenting the better sides of ourselves. The Photoshop versions, as it were. And so it's natural to keep the darker recesses of our souls 
hidden as much as we can, mostly because we just don't want to risk the pain of immediate rejection. However, as time passes, it's pretty much inevitable that those less attractive parts, both our own and our partners, will eventually come out and become noticeable. And at that stage, what real love requires is the ability to perceive all of that and to recognize the other person's inevitable faults and imperfections and still find beauty in the other person. In fact, maybe he or she is even more beautiful because of all of that. After all, our flaws are an important part of what makes us unique human beings and not just plastic cookie cutter Ken and Barbie dolls. Or to put it another way, Real love means seeing and appreciating each other for who we really are, in both our strengths and our weaknesses, in both the parts of us that are brilliant and healthy, as well as the parts that are dark and malformed. It's basically about learning to love each other as complete human beings, rather than as oversimplified caricatures of what we really are. But beyond all of that, real love is also about sharing the rocky road of life together as genuine companions. It's about a kind of companionship of shared souls, as it were. Another way of talking about that idea would be in terms of learning to care deeply about each other, not merely as a function of what we can do for each other or how we can satisfy each other's desires, but learning to care about the entire pattern of each other's existence, especially as something beautiful and worthy of affirmation. Furthermore, I'd say that that same basic thing also applies to the forms of interpersonal love that don't have any romantic or sexual component. The love between good friends or family members, for instance, or even the love we sometimes have for animals. Ultimately, that kind of love is also about seeing and appreciating each other for who we really are and enjoying the beauty of our companionship with each other along the way. But one of the things that makes all of that tricky is the fact that we human beings aren't necessarily stationary targets. In fact, most of us change in some fairly profound ways as we mature and grow over time. So in that regard, real love isn't only about seeing and appreciating each other as complete human beings. It's also about participating in each other's ongoing struggles to grow and transcend ourselves, to become more than what we already are. That is, it's about actively involving ourselves in each other's process of growing toward whatever we might possibly become in this life, and especially with respect to fulfilling our deeper possibilities and potentials. In other words, real love is dynamic in nature. It changes and grows as we ourselves change and grow. A personal example. My wife and I often like to describe our relationship as a kind of therapeutic marriage. In other words, a big part of what our love is about has to do with helping each other grow, not only at a psychological level, but at a deep spiritual level too. Of course, part of what that requires is a certain willingness, <laughs> on both of our parts, to endure the inevitable pangs of insecurity and anxiety that often accompany deep change. And a lot of that circulates around the following unsettling question. What if she or I or both of us change in some way that makes our love relationship more difficult or even impossible. What then? And yeah, the fact is that that's always a very real possibility, especially if we're actively seeking out life's deeper actualities together with our partners. But on the other hand, what's the alternative? To remain static and perpetually stuck in our already existing routines and habits? Is that really the brave and powerful path through this life? Or is it just a way of being ruled by our fears? I guess it's obvious that Mrs. Dodson and I think that it's mostly the latter. And so, despite our inevitable anxieties about where our relationship is taking us, we strive to bring out the best in each other more and more with each passing day and each passing year. And I'd say that that too is part of what real love means. Sure. Having a good time is great, and sometimes love is exactly about that, but sometimes it's about more than that, and a lot more than that. And one way to gauge the depth of our love relationships, whether it's in the form of a romantic or sexual relationship or one that's just between friends, 
is to ask ourselves whether we're really drawing out the best in each other, inviting each other to realize the more luminous and more noble parts of what we are, and eventually moving towards something like a destiny together. And in essence, that's what Mrs. Dodson's and my therapeutic marriage is all about. But of course, at this point, it's probably fairly natural to ask something like, well, okay, but are there other forms of love that lie beyond all of that? Personally, I'm pretty sure that there are. After all, we live in an incomprehensibly vast and subtle universe, and we ourselves are incomprehensibly vast and subtle. So, why wouldn't the same be true of what we call love? So, I hope that you aren't construing what I'm telling you as some sort of final answer to the riddle of love, because <laughs> it's not. It's just what life has taught me about it so far. Anyhow, at this point, let's move on to the third region of love I mentioned at the start of this video, our love for life itself. A kind of existential love, as it were. And I think that the first thing to say about it is that if we can manage to love inanimate entities in the world and at the same time learn to love the living beings in it, well, then loving life itself gets a lot easier, and vice versa. In other words, for the most part, how we love life is mostly a reflection of how we love each other and even how we love inanimate entities. And at the same time, how we love each other and inanimate entities is a reflection of how we love life. Basically, they all influence and shape one another. But at this point, we should probably also make note of how challenging it really is to love life. Sure, if someone asks us whether we love life, which I guess I'm implicitly doing both for you and for myself right now, it's pretty easy just to say, yeah, I do. After all, all we have to do at that point is remember all of the great experiences we've had along the way. You know, count up all of our orgasms, all of the pepperoni pizzas we've eaten, and all of the happiness we've experienced during our great victories and celebrations, and it becomes pretty easy to tell ourselves, and anyone else who asks, that we do indeed love life. But on the other hand, if we're also willing to be honest and forthright about all the stuff that's on the other side of the scale, you know, all of our dark, forlorn nights of the soul, all of the times we've been deceived, demeaned, betrayed, bullied, maligned, mistreated, objectified, and ostracized, as well as all of the crushing burdens we've had to shoulder with each passing day until those days become months and the months become years and the years eventually become a lifetime of sweat and unendurable weariness. Well, gets a little bit harder just to say a glib yes to that question now, doesn't it? And beyond all of that, if we happen to possess any sort of ability to perceive just how much grinding stupidity and cruelty and pure unmitigated insanity there is in the world, both historically and in the present, well, that makes giving an easy yes answer even harder. That's because when it comes down to it, there are always about 10,000 good convincing reasons to hate life and to hate it with a relentless, raging passion. And really, there are only a handful of good reasons to love it. Personally, I suspect that our friend Friedrich Nietzsche was onto one of those latter reasons, and maybe even the ultimate one. Against the backdrop of everything that is unremittingly black and bleak in this world, without warning, beauty can sometimes flash like lightning suddenly arcing across the midnight sky, its unbridled ferocity briefly illuminating the world in all of its intricate and incalculable splendor, reminding us that the many reasons we have to hate life may be completely valid, but they're only part of the picture, only a fraction of the grand totality of things. You know, the unexpected beauty of human kindness and human courage can be like that, like inexplicable bolts of lightning falling without reason from the sky all around us, beautiful enough and powerful enough to shock us and sear us in our very souls and leave us changed forever. And, well, I don't know about you, but personally, I'm a holist. And consequently, I believe it's important to recognize many different sides of things simultaneously, as many as we can given our limited human perspective on things. And so for me, 
Neglecting the reasons we have to hate life would be a way of negating its larger totality, and hence a way of misunderstanding it. But so would neglecting the reasons we have to love life. And in any case, our capacity to experience love is always secretly linked to our capacity to experience hatred, especially since they both ultimately spring from the same source, which is our capacity to experience life with passion and verve. And so, if you were to ask me, do you love life? My answer would probably be yes and no. And maybe some of you think that that's just a way of sitting on the fence, as they say. But to me, sitting on fences and refusing to give in to simplistic binary oppositions requires an extraordinary kind of balance and is actually a pretty delicate and subtle art in its own right. But of course, as in all things, your own results may vary. Anyhow, thanks as always for watching, and until next time, take care of your soul.